Hello, everybody. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. And if you can't, please send us a message in the chat box. But I just wanted to introduce myself before I introduce our speaker for today. My name is Dr. Ina Park. I'm the medical director of the California Prevention Training Center. And just to make sure you know where you are, you're joining us for today's STD Expert Hour webinar, which is Genital Dermatology 101 uh, with Ken Katz who is a dermatologist at Kaiser Permanente San Francisco, and I have had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Katz since he was an epidemic um, intelligence um, service officer with the CDC, and then he was the STD controller in San Diego for the uh, city and county of San Diego before coming back to the Bay Area to join the staff at Kaiser Permanente. So we are really excited he's gonna be talking with us today. Uh, so I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, here's what you're going to see. There's some uh, webinar housekeeping slides here. You can see that um, there's going to be a little box on your screen showing um, your computer audio options. So you can either do this through your computer audio or you can do it through the phone. And if you do have a shaky internet connection, we recommend that you do use the phone. Um, and then you'll see as well um, a uh, phone number, access code, and an audio pin. And just a little bit of a closer up um, view, you can use the orange button with the arrow to minimize or expand your control panel. And you can use uh, the white arrow to expand the questions box that you can enter uh, questions for our presenter and we will uh, answer those at the end. And again, um, I just mentioned that you can change your audio option in the, in the middle if you do have issues during this uh, broadcast. And a closer up of the question box right there as well for you to see. And just a brief word about the CAPTC. So um, we are a multidisciplinary training and capacity building assistance center funded by the CDC. We've been funded for over 25 years. And uh, we actually cover a region that includes New Mexico, Arizona, Hawaii, um, and California, and Nevada. And I just wanted to mention that we have quite a few clinical resources. Um, on our website, CaliforniaPTC.com, there's actually, um, just wanted to point out a toolkit for those of you who are trying to implement um, extra genital screening, which is screening of the throat and the rectum for gonorrhea and chlamydia, including self-collected swabbing during this time of COVID-19. Um, as well as lots of resources for national guidelines and best practices. And then finally, um, a link to our clinical consultation line, stdccn.org, where you can ask us your difficult clinical consultation questions. So really important here um, for CME, this is the fine print from our CME provider. We will email um, certificates about six to eight weeks after completion of this course, but you must, must fill out an evaluation for you to get credit. And so please um, fill out your online evaluation form um, when it comes in through your uh, email. More fine print that we have no disclosures today from our speaker. And for questions, please contact our coordinator and clinical program manager, Elizabeth Olson, and here's her email. And that is it for me, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Katz. Let's see. Okay, take it away, Dr. Katz. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Park. It's really a pleasure to, to be here and to present this. Uh, I'll just say a few minutes, then I'll just switch to my slides. But uh, as Ina mentioned, I work in STD clinics uh, settings myself. That's the genital part, and I've, uh, I'm a board-certified dermatologist, and I've been a uh, good one for more than 15 years. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and there's a lot of overlap between the two, but I think often the two sides don't necessarily appreciate that. So I'm hoping going to... to to um, uh, bring those two uh, areas closer together today. So I'm gonna try to show my screen here. Okay, all right. Um, and I'm gonna stop my webcam. Okay. Um, so I do have uh, no conflicts to disclose. The objectives today are to differentiate between genital skin diseases to formulate differential diagnoses for genital skin diseases and to identify general skin diseases that warrant referral to uh, specialty care like a dermatologist like me. 
So one approach to talking about genital dermatology is the disease-based approach. We go through various STDs, syphilis, herpes, LGD, and other ones, and then some non-STDs. Um, but that sort of assumes that the disease that's before you in the STD clinic presents itself like, hello, my name is Shanker, and hits you in the head with it, not literally. But um, that's really not how it happens in, in medicine. And rather, um, we get, a, uh, we get a, a syndrome. We get, hello, my name is penile sore, and then it's up to us to figure out um, what is going on with that penile sore. So I'm, I'm gonna to try to present it going the other way, that is a syndrome-based approach, talking about lumps and bumps, uh, rashes and erosions and ulcers. So I'm gonna be presenting photos first and ask you, we don't have that much time, but ask you if you can just sort of think in your head, what is the diagnosis here? What is the range of diagnosis? And then you'll, you'll, you'll get the answer on the next slide uh, and sort of can, can quiz yourself that way. Um, some bonus STD posters along the way. But before we start there, just a word about terminology because dermatologists like me love terminology. So we've got all these like plain English words for lesions like flat and raised and we can't have that. We have to have like our technical terms, macules and patches and patches and plaques, macula, papula, mobilis, I could go on and on. But uh, I do think these are, are nice to know but um, I would encourage you and all non-dermatologists to just speak in plain English. If you're describing something in writing or if you're talking to a dermatologist like me, we don't require use of the jargon. And in fact, someone like me, it makes me a little bit nervous because people who are not that familiar with the, the jargon can, it can become confusing. And I wonder, you know, is it really, are we meaning the same things? And I think that's eliminated, that problem is eliminated. If we just rely on, on, our, on plain English, there's nothing wrong with that. And there's a lot right with that, in fact. Okay, so let's go on to the, the syndromes. And we're gonna start with some, some lumps and bumps. Uh, first, a poster, it's one of my favorite ones from Toronto, Attack of the Cursed Syphilis. It's lurking in the depths, watch out, starring syphilis, you and you, and maybe you too. Great, nothing like scaring us. Um, so this is the first lumps and bumps, these little bumps on the uh, corona of the penis and, and three different views. And these are uh, pearly penile papules. These are flesh-colored bumps that occur really right around the ring of the, of the glands, the corona. They tend to be all similar in appearance, in appearance about one to three millimeters. They're, they're dome-shaped. They're just lined up one after the other. Much more common in uncircumcised compared to circumcised people. Um, they are um, asymptomatic. They can be mistaken for warts in my experience. That's mostly from the patient being very concerned. Maybe a sex partner uh, pointed it out to the patient. And um, really the best approach is to reassure the patient that this is a normal variant. Uh, there are treatments available, sort of cosmetic or elective treatments, uh, if a patient wants them. Those include lasers, um, electrical, electricity treatment, and uh, liquid nitrogen. I have less experience with liquid nitrogen than the other two, uh, but here's just an example of how this can, can look after treatment, uh, a paper from about five years ago after um, a fractionated carbon dioxide uh, laser, and a pretty good cosmetic result. Um, uh, for this patient. Okay, our second lumps and bumps. Um, these are little sort of yellowish oranges, uh, orangish bumps that are lined up on the, the shafts of the, uh, of the penis or on the vulva um, on the, uh, or on the, um, the previous, the, the foreskin as well. And this is uh, sebaceous hyperplasia, another very common concern that patient ha patients have when they, when they notice this, because it can become more noticeable as people get older. They're flesh colored to yellow, they're flat or bumpy, um, they're asymptomatic. Uh, what distinguishes them is that they, I'm just gonna go back, they're often very um, equally spaced between one another. So a disease or an infection tends not to be that, um, that uh, uh, exact in its, in its spacing between the, the lesions. They're really lined up uh, as almost as somebody plowed them on a, on a field and, and diseases tend not to do that. So that's a clue to sebaceous hyperplasia. The differential includes warts, and that's, I think, what, what patients are often concerned about when they notice these. Um, reassurance um, is, is the best approach here. It's a normal variant. And you can also tell patients that it can occur on other areas of the body. Here's an example of a patient with sebaceous hyperplasia on the lips. Uh, very common, and I think once you become sensitized to this, if you start looking around, well, now we have all have masks on. But if, before COVID, if you were looking around, uh, you would see this very commonly on, on people's lips. All right, our next lumps and bumps, uh, these little um, reddish bumps on the, on the vulva, 
or on the scrotum on the two photos on the right. And these are examples of what we call angiokeratomas or fordyce spots. Um, they are very common red uh, or purple dome-shaped bumps that occur most typically on the scrotum or the vulva. More developed with age, so people will notice that they're not born with them and they'll often be very concerned once they, they start appearing that something is, is, is wrong with them. They are asymptomatic. If, if they are traumatized, they, they can't bleed like anywhere on the skin, but that's pretty rare in my experience. Differential might, might include warts here or, or other vascular uh, lesions that we can talk about later, but they're very characteristic uh, appearance. Um, reassurance, again, is the best approach for, for these um, angiokeratomas. It's a normal variant. You can tell people that they can expect to develop more with time that to, to get ahead of it to make them expect that. Um, there are treatments, again, these are cosmetic or elective treatments, but laser can be very effective, uh, electricity or, or sclerotherapy as well. And I'll just show you an example of uh, sclerotherapy of the, um, of, the, of the vulva. So you inject the sclerosing agent, which basically destroys the, the blood vessels where the, the blood runs through. And the cosmetic result is not amazing in this, in this photo, but it, I think it's pretty good. It's better than it was. Um, I think probably electricity or um, laser, in my experience, probably had better results. But, but this is another approach, too. All right, lumps and bumps number four. Um, so starting on the left, some, some grayish brown bumps at the, uh, on the penile shaft, uh, a rather large spot on the vulva in the middle, and some perianal uh, bumps uh, on, on, the, on the right. So these are our genital warts. Uh, technically, they're also called condyloma acuminatum. Um, they're caused typically by HPV type 6 and 11, which are um, included in the, in the Gardasil uh, vaccine. They're typically uh, asymptomatic. Um, they are well circumscribed papules, bumps, I should say, uh, with varying shapes. So some of them can stick up, some of them can be more uh, broad based, uh, some of them can be flesh colored, whatever color the patient's skin is. They can be darker or sometimes even slightly lighter than the, the patient's skin, uh, skin tone. They can be found anywhere in the anal genital area uh, on the skin or the mucous membranes. And of course, warts, non genital warts, can occur in other areas of the body as well, um, common warts or, or plantar warts, for example, warts around the, um, around the fingernails as well. I'll just refer you to the STD guidelines, CDC's STD uh, treatment guidelines of 2015. There are a number of recommended regimens, um, and I'll just tell you sort of what, what I uh, do for them. Uh, I always have a conversation with the patient because um, I, will I will tell patients that no treatment is certainly acceptable. These are harmless growths. Having said that, when most people are seeing me because they don't like them there, so they want treatment, and then we can start talking about uh, which treatments are uh, available. So in the office, uh, liquid nitrogen therapy uh, can be used. Um, surgical removal or uh, burning of them um, with electricity could be considered as well. It's a little bit more invasive. I tend to, to not do that except in special uh, circumstances because they're not necessarily more effective than the cryotherapy or medical treatment uh, uh, is, and it's a little bit just more invasive that might leave a scar. Um, for the medical treatment, these are patient-applied imiquimod. Um, I crossed that 3.75% cream, so I don't think that's very available. So I use the 5% cream three times per week up to 16 weeks, or podophylox uh, twice per day for three days, off for four days, up to four cycles. Um, I have more experience with these two regimens than with the Tinicotecan, um, which is Verigen is the brand name for that. But imiquimod and podophylox are much less expensive. Um, they do cause a lot of inflammation. So I, I definitely warn people about that uh, to expect that. And I warn them that when their skin is, is damaged from the inflammation that these medicines can cause, it's easier for other, potentially for, at least theoretically, for other sexually transmitted diseases to get into the skin. So I, I tell them about that. Um, so imiquimod, pedophilox are really my preferred uh, at-home regimen and cryotherapy uh, in the office for, for warts. Okay, um, the CDC guidelines talk about intra-anal warts as well. Um, they sort of hedge on this in my opinion, and I, I think that's probably correct. Um, they say that persons with external anal warts might benefit from inspection of the anal canal by digital examination, standard anoscopy, or high-resolution anoscopy. I think if we're going to look for them, we'll often find them. The problem is what to do 
with that information once they're there? Is there any evidence that that actually improves outcomes for patients? It does certainly lead to many more procedures and uh, pathologizing of, of the anatomy that, that may not, may have uh, detrimental effects as well. So I think we just have to need to, we need to consider that the pros and cons of that carefully. Uh, in my experience or what my practice is generally to limit that um, to people who are um, symptomatic or who are really worried about by, uh, on the basis of their external genital warts, that they might have something more than genital warts that is like, like anal cancer or, or a precancerous uh, lesion uh, uh, in the, uh, in the anus. All right, moving on to lumps and bumps number five. Um, on the, starting on the left, there are a bunch of red bumps on the lower abdomen. Moving to the middle, there are some light-colored um, dome-shaped bumps on the scrotum and the penis, and more visible on the, on the right. Um, and you'll notice that uh, there's trimming on the right, too, which we'll talk about as well. So this is molluscum contagiosum, a very common a uh, viral um, STD. Uh, it can be a non-STD as well, particularly in kids, but when in, in adults, particularly in these areas, it's, uh, it's generally sexually transmitted. Uh, you see dome-shaped bumps with central umbilication, and a pearl to that is to use liquid nitrogen to highlight that umbilication. And the reason that that can be helpful is not, it's they're very small, and sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate these from genital warts. And uh, this simple diagnostic maneuver allows you to make the diagnosis um, uh, quite easily. And I'll show you that in the next slide. They, they're usually asymptomatic, but they can um, have what's called molluscum dermatitis, or an itchy red rash around the bumps, which is thought to, to represent the body's um, immune system reacting against the, the virus. So that, that, that is generally thought as a, as a good thing, but it can be uncomfortable. That can be calmed down with a little bit of hydrocortisone a uh, 1% cream or, or uh, a low-strength uh, prescription topical steroid like hydrocortisone 2.5% cream. The differential diagnosis most commonly includes warts, and that's what we're trying to, to figure out with these small bumps in the, um, in the general area. I just want to say uh, for, for molluscan as well as for warts, I, I really remind patients or, or encourage them to avoid shaving or trimming uh, while the problem is going on, because there's a higher chance uh, that they will take some of the virus that's in the molluscum or in the wart and spread it to other areas of the skin that they've nicked or micro-nicked with the shaving or the trimming, and therefore uh, thereby introduce the virus into other areas of the skin. Um, so I think that's important to emphasize to patients as well as to let them know that uh, they can transmit this by skin-to-skin -skin contact. So I wanted to show you this um, uh, this video. So this is a non-genital molluscum. Uh, it's just on the neck, but it, the, the same technique holds. So you're going to see on the left that the that liquid nitrogen gun, and it's a it's a quick video. But you'll see once I start spraying the liquid nitrogen that uh, the center really appears very uh, uh, very uh, markedly. That that oh, that umbilication. Let me see if I can get that. Okay, here we go. So that really, that divot really stands out when you do that. And, you know, this one is not very difficult. I think it's, a, it's an easy diagnosis here. But if it's smaller in the genital area, if it looks a little atypical, um, I encourage you to, to, to do that, to, to differentiate. And I often tell patients, they're, they're worried that I'm going to spray a lot of liquid nitrogen in just a quick burst. Often I will spray it on there somewhere else on their hand or on my hand to show them what it'll feel like before uh, it's sprayed in the general area. There are a lot of different treatments for uh, molluscum contagiosum. This is uh, an article from Lancet Infectious Diseases that goes over them. I'll just focus on really a few that, that I use. Um, so there are two in the office, liquid nitrogen, um, which probably have available in STD clinics. Curatage, um, you probably don't, but that's a, that's a technique where you take a, a sharp um, instrument, almost like a circular knife, and scrape it against the bottom of the molluscum, sort of pop it off, and that tends to, to cure people. It does very well without, without scarring. Uh, dermatologists are very used to doing that procedure, maybe less so in STD clinics. In terms of at-home treatments, salicylic acid is the one that I usually recommend, 17% gel or liquid. Uh, every day is tolerated. That's available over the counter and typically marketed for, for warts rather than for molluscum, but there's some evidence that it works for molluscum as well. 
Uh, sometimes we'll try tretinoin uh, cream, which is Retin-A, which is an acne cream, but not used for, for that purpose. But, but if you've had experience using it for acne, it irritates the skin a little bit. And the thought is that that irritation uh, activates the immune system to uh, act against the uh, uh, molluscum. That would be daily if tolerated as well. In children or non-genital areas, you could consider Confederidin, which is a blistering agent, uh, which you put on and then the patient washes off 46, 46 hours afterwards. I'm, uh, I hesitate to use that in the general area just because it can be quite irritating. Just one note that imiquimod, which has been, which had been touted for many years as a treatment for molluscum, um, doesn't actually work. There's some pretty good evidence in, in randomized controlled trials in children that it's not effective for molluscum. So my practice has changed to not use uh, molluscum any longer, uh, not use imiquimod any longer for molluscum because it does cause a lot of irritation and it actually doesn't really work. So let's go on to lumps and bumps number six. Um, so these are um, yellowish, whitish bumps on the on the scrotum. Um, they're a little bit more irregular on the on the lower left. These are scrotal cysts. These are a type of epidermal cyst that can express a cheesy, foul-smelling discharge. Um, the longer they're there, the more they can calcify, so they become white and hard. They don't express anything at that point. They're just sort of sitting there white and hard. They have a smooth, shiny surface. Um, they can be single or multiple over time. People tend to develop more of them with time. They typically start in adolescence or adulthood. Again, reassurance here is important. And the only treatment that really works is a surgical treatment, um, which would likely be considered elective um, by many insurance companies, but can be important for patients. It, it's, they're quite easy to remove, and the cosmetic outcome is pretty good if people do want to do this. Are right, the next lumps and bumps? Uh, um, uh, I'm starting on the left. There's a uh, sort of a, a bump, reddish white bump. It's lost the top, uh, the top of its uh, surface. I'm trying to avoid using my dermatology words to tell you what's going on. It's difficult for me. Um, on the on the top in the middle, there's a shiny red um, bump, uh, and on the other two, there's sort of exophytic or, or masses that are growing out from the. Uh, the tip of the penis or from the, um, the, the, the glands and the uh, shaft of the penis. Uh, and these are more concerning uh, spots. These are squamous cell carcinomas or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. In situ means that the, the cancer is confined to the very top layer of the skin. So that's a favorable thing. It's less invasive compared with invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Um, this can present a single or multiple spots, um, often on the glands. Um, but can be in other areas as well. Uh, can present as red or moist, velvety or scaly, um, sort of whitish, uh, hard material plaques. Um, occurs more commonly in uncircumcised and circumcised people, uh, more commonly in older compared with younger people caused by HPV. And squamous cell carcinoma can occur anywhere in the skin, including in the genital, perianal, and, and other, and anal area anal areas and other areas of the, the body, which is sort of where they're more common. It's very sun-related uh, sun in other areas of the body, but not in the, um, uh, not in the general area. Um, diagnosis is by biopsy, and the treatment is medical or surgical, or depending on, the, on how much it's invaded, you might need, in fact, more treatment than that. But if you're suspicious of this, um, the way to go would be referral to a dermatologist. We can easily uh, biopsy uh, these solutions if, if necessary. Uh, and then either treat them ourselves um, or refer them to um, urology or even medical oncology if, if needed or surgical oncology, um, depending on, um, on, on what it looks like. So let's go into lumps and bumps number eight. So these are just reddish patches on the, uh, sort of flat, flat patches on the, on the glands in, in two views here. And this is what's called Zune or that's someone's name, or plasma cell balanitis. Balanitis just means uh, inflammation of the glands. That's unknown etiology or cause, but what you see if you biopsy these is plasma cells, that's a certain type of cell in the immune system uh, that are uh, abundant in these, uh, in these lesions. Uh, it's often seen or really only seen in uncircumcised people. The treatment is with topical corticosteroids. Um, and if it's not responsive, really have to consider a biopsy. And this always makes me Nervous, it made me even more nervous when I was working in STD clinics where the follow-up was less assured because really the, I want to see the patient back or I want to at least get a photo or know from the patient that this has gone away because if not, 
the differential does include things like squamous cell carcinoma, including squamous cell carcinoma in situ or other types of uh, balanitis. Um, it's also good to avoid a biopsy on the penis, particularly on the glands. People don't like that. Dermatologists generally, it's not a, I can do it. It's not my favorite procedure because it is quite, quite painful uh, for people and they do get a scar there. So, you know, if you're suspicious of this, it could be worth treating if you think that the, the patient is going to follow up with you so you can take action if it's not gone away. Let's go on to lumps and bumps number nine. This is a, uh, an image from the New England Journal just a few months ago. And this has a few things going on. There's some, some red, uh, uh, a red bump, and then there's some sort of loss of the surface of the skin in the middle. And this is uh, Kaposi sarcoma of the penis. It's um, caused by a uh, human herpes virus, herpes virus number eight, more common among men who have sex with men and those with HIV. But it can occur uh, even in patients who have well-controlled HIV, and it can occur in the absence of HIV infection, particularly in men who have sex with men. Of course, we're definitely going to encourage testing for HIV if the person is not known to be living with HIV. Um, and then the treatment is, depending on where it is and how big it is, you could consider liquid nitrogen, injected or systemic chemotherapy or excision. And this is probably something that if you're suspicious about, you can want to refer to a, um, a dermatologist because it's really a, a biopsy, a, a pathologic diagnosis. Let's move on to lumps and bumps number 10. So these are basically brown spots uh, or bumps on, on the, in the genital area, starting on the left, the shaft of the penis, and some uh, brown areas on the, the vulva, and then some really darker and irregular areas on the right. I sort of grouped these together as uh, melanocytic lesions. So a melanocyte is a type of cell in the skin uh, that can, uh, that confers protection against sun, uh, and it's often uh, can produce extra melanin or there can be more melanocytes for benign reasons, but uh, there can also be cancers associated with these as well. And when it becomes cancerous, it's a melanoma. Um, you can also uh, get uh, spots on the general area associated with syndromes, like Poitier sy syndrome that can, that can cr produce uh, brown spots in many different areas of the body. So this can be a difficult um, diagnosis. You probably want to ask about you know, how long the spot has been there. Has it changed at all? Are there any symptoms? And if there's any question uh, that this is a melanoma, because that's certainly something you don't want to miss, uh, you're going to want to uh, uh, refer the person for a biopsy to a dermatologist. Uh, and the, the amount of irregularity that you see in that, the lower, the lowest picture on the right, uh, really is, uh, is concerning uh, in comparison with, say, the middle photo where it's symmet very symmetric. Um, uh, so the, the top one, uh, was presented as a case of benign mel uh, melanotic macules, uh, and that could be, I'm, I'm not sure I would not have biopsied that if I saw that in, in my clinic. It probably would depend a little bit on the, the history. If, if, in fact, the person had it for 10 years, which is what the case report says, I, I would be more uh, reassured. Sorry, this is another capsule sarcoma slide. Okay, let's move on to, uh, to rashes. So, got a rash on your hand, take one of these. Um, syphilis, a serious disease, uh, a simple cure. Um, no even website here. This is old school. All right. So let's go into rashes number one. So uh, these are a few uh, uh, photos of the, the penis and the, the general area with a lot of uh, bumps, some of which are look like they're scratched off. Um, they're very red. And this is a diagnosis of scabies. So this is caused by a mite called Cercopteus scabiagar hominis. And what the scabies mite does is that it lives on the skin and it burrows into the very top layer of the skin, which is called the epidermis. Uh, and that's how it uh, gets its food. That's where it lays its eggs. That's where it gets rid of its uh, fecal material. And um, the body will develop an allergic type reaction to scabies. And that's what really produces the problem. And that can take for the, the immune system to get sensitized it can take weeks to develop after the first infestation. So people, if they're worried about, they just got exposed to scabies and they start scratching themselves, it's probably a, not, a, not a true itch, but it's probably psychosomatic. Um, if somebody's been sensitized previously, the reaction can, can be much quicker. But I think it's really important to understand that the discomfort that people are feeling is, is more, is really from the body's immune reaction 
than it is from the, the mites themselves. There are actually very small numbers of mites on, on an immunocompetent patient, only about 12 or so when, it, when, you look, when you do studies of this. But it can cause intense widespread itch that typically spares the head and neck. So that's really important. Somebody's complaining of itch on the head and neck if they're immunocompetent would make scabies much less likely. On the right, that photo is um, the yellow spots indicate the areas outside of the general areas where we typically see um, the, the scabies mites present. So that's on the, the, um, the wrists and the elbows, the axilla, maybe around the waist, the knees and the ankles. And we don't look nothing on the head. When I look for burrows and look for nodules on the genital. So when I see an itchy nodule on the genital area, I'm really thinking scabies and so I'm satisfied that it might be something else, which often it's, it's not. But, but when you do have those nodules on the genital area, that's very uh, characteristic of a scabies infestation. I'll just show you what the burrows look like. These are often between the, uh, the web spaces. On the, uh, it looks like uh, on the, um, on the right-hand side, you can see that track. That's the track that the, um, that the scabies mite has made. And it's red because the body is inflamed and, and the immune system is reacting against the, uh, against the mite and other stuff that the mite might have left uh, in the burrow. Um, so if you're able to do a scabies prep under the microscope, this is very satisfying because you can, if you can see the organism, you nail the diagnosis, and you're able to tell the patient, here's what you're going to do and I'll be able to cure you. But you basically take some, some mineral oil and you put it either on the skin or you can put it on the, uh, on the scalpel. You, you scrape and you have to scrape pretty hard and you wipe it on a glass slide and then you put it under the microscope. 10x is fine. If, if you're having to go to 40x, it's probably too much. So 10x is fine. You can be looking for either the, the mite, which is on the top right, and it's even more gratifying if you can see it sort of scampering away and waving its, uh, its tendrils. Um, or you can see um, on the bottom right, the, the egg-shaped uh, bodies are eggs of the scabies mite and the little brown specks our fecal materials in mite. And if you're lucky, you'll get the trifecta and see all three of these. So how do we treat this? Um, I think it's really important to treat both the mites and the itch or the inflammation. Those are really two separate things. Giving, treating the mites alone is not, might help the, the infestation, but it's not gonna make the person more comfortable immediately. And people are typically pretty uncomfortable with the scabies infestation. So, for the mites, it's permethrin 5% cream, that's prescription. If you give 60 grams, that should give enough for a normal adult to apply it from neck to toes, keeping on for eight, eight to 14 hours, two applications separated by one week each. So that's all they need. If, if you're having to repeat that treatment many times, I think it's time to start thinking about, uh, you know, did we miss an, another diagnosis, not, another cause of the itch or the rash? And at the same time, um, treat the itch, and that can persist even after the treatment for weeks. So it's not a treatment failure if somebody's still itchy after doing permethrin cream um, twice. Um, so how do you treat that? Either with prednisone, um, and a common taper I'll use is 60 milligrams, which is an average adult size, uh, average size adult, 60 milligrams a day for seven days, 40 for seven days, 20 for seven days. You can try a topical steroid such as um, uh, triencidolone as well. But if people are really have a lot of itch and a lot of real estate in terms of skin to cover, that can become difficult. Um, it takes a lot of cream and a lot of time. Antihistamines can be helpful because they, they kind of make people tired, but it's not really a histamine-mediated itch that's going on here. So they sort of have a limited utility. If somebody can't do permethrin, ivermectin would be another, uh, oral ivermectin would be another uh, alternative for treatment. And then there's some environmental control that is probably worth doing, washing sheets, towels, and clothes for the past three days. And then there's uh, partner management treating or considering treating close contacts um, empirically, uh, even if they haven't manifested an itch yet to prevent that from happening. Okay, rash is number two. So this is uh, genital hair, and you can see it's, there are a lot of little spots on the hairs. Um, and this is uh, pubic lice. And if you, you, this is a, you can see these macroscopically, you can't see them in this much detail, but if you were to grab them and put them on a slide and put them under the microscope under 10X or even 4X, uh, you would see them very clearly. These are also called crabs and they um, can affect the, the pubic hair, but they really have a predilection for any um, hair that shares that same caliber. And we sometimes see that in the axilla, 
as well as in the eyelashes. Um, and you can see that in the top right photo. So it's not only in the pubic area. Uh, this causes, uh, they, they, they cause an itch uh, and people scratch them and they break the skin. That can cause uh, the lymph nodes in the groin to enlarge. You see these macroscopically about one millimeter brown to gray specks on the hair. And then sometimes people will develop these gray blue spots called maculate cerulea in the groin and on the buttocks. And that's shown in this, um, uh, this the, the photo on the right. That's thought to be maybe breakdown product of, of heme that's caused by the uh, lice, lice infestation. Uh, and I've pasted the CDC uh, treatment instructions here, but it's, it's uh, basically permethrin 1% lotion, which is available over the counter uh, as very effective treatment. So let's go to rashes number three. Uh, so these are uh, two images of the, of the penis, one with the foreskin uh, non-retracted, one with a bit retracted. You can see this sort of cheesy white material and, and red rash with some fissuring uh, on the uh, on the foreskin and, and on the glands as well. And if you were to look at it under the microscope, if you were to scrape it, it has this um, what we call spaghetti and meatball appearance. So pseudo hyphae and those little dots, which are the, the meatballs are very easily uh, visible. And this is candidal balanitis, which occurs much more commonly in uncircumcised compared with circumcised people. Uh, the white bumps or the scale can be removed by gentle scraping with a with a scalpel or you know use something else to scrape it away. Um, it can be easily visualized using uh, KOH and a microscope. Easy treatment with clotrimazole one percent cream, which is available over the counter twice a day for a week or two. Or there are many other azole uh, antifungals which would be effective. Or terbinafine would probably be, which is lamisole, would be effective as well. Um, Canada can also infect the the skin fold, so. You could ask the person might be might have this problem in other areas as well, and it's it's uh, seen in more commonly in people with diabetes who are not uh, whose blood sugar is not under good control. So you might ask them about other symptoms of diabetes and consider screening for diabetes, particularly if it's a very um, severe case. Okay, rashes number four. This is one of the most common non-STDs that I would see in the STD clinic. And one of the most common um, conditions that, that I see in my dermatology clinic from people who are very concerned that they, that they have a sexually transmitted disease. But you see these, these red bumps, um, maybe a little bit scaly on the, on the penis, uh, on the glands and the shaft. And this is psoriasis, a very common chronic inflammatory condition. We don't know exactly what causes this. Uh, it's present in about one to 2% of the population. And it causes these well demarcated, by which I mean, you know, you can really draw a line around these spots uh, on the skin. And one thing we know makes it worse is trauma or friction of the skin. Um, and that's why um, I will always ask people um, whether it gets worse with sex or masturbation. And often people will say um, yes, and that's really a clue to uh, psoriasis because uh, uh, this really gets worse with trauma or friction. Look for other signs of psoriasis, um, and I'll show you some of those. And treatments with either with a topical steroid or a topical calcineurin inhibitor, um, like tacrolimus ointment or pimecrolimus cream. If there's more widespread involvement, um, refer to a dermatologist because the person might need a systemic treatment that could treat the general area as well as other areas. But it's important to tell patients it's not sexually transmitted, it can be given to somebody else. Um, and I also say the good news is it's, you know, it's, it's treatable. The bad news is we, we don't have a cure for it. So I, I set their expectations for something that is likely to, um, to come back. And I'll say, in fact, if people are engaging in an activity that they know will bring it out after they're done with that, it doesn't have to be right after they're done, but after they're done with that activity, they can give themselves an extra application of whatever medicine they're using to try to nip it in the bud before it appears, because it typically appears at exactly the same space, uh, spot every time. Um, so here's just an example of somebody who's got um, the red spots on the penis, and then that's his elbow, and the, the extensor area of the elbow is a very common location for psoriasis. Um, here's another one on the left, some, uh, some red bumps on the glands and the shaft, and then somebody's got a little bit of dandruff uh, in the scalp as well. This is a patient with, um, with scaly uh, red areas on the on the penis and then if you turn around there are these um, well demarcated red circles with scale on the buttocks and finally just a little bit more uh, dramatic appearance especially on the extensor surfaces of the knees um, and the elbows 
You can also get what we call inverse psoriasis, and instead of the extensor surfaces, this occurs in the body folds, probably also because there's rubbing of the skin against the skin in those areas, and that brings out the inflammation in the skin. It's symmetric in, in the, um, the gluteal plaques. You can see it in inguinal folds as well. Let's move on to uh, rashes number five. So these are red rashes in the inguinal folds of, uh, uh, of three patients here. And this is tinea cruris, or commonly called jock itch. Uh, usually occurs on the superior medial thighs and can occur on the buttocks as well. There's an accentuation of the scale peripherally, so along the edge, and typically with central clearing. So it, the skin looks a little bit more normal toward the center of the spot. The diagnosis is, is clinical if you're good at this, or you can also prove it under the microscope by doing a KOH prep. And the treatment is with OTC, clotrimazole, 1% cream twice a day. If there's extensive involvement, you can consider oral therapy, and it raises the question of whether the person has diabetes or whether the person is uh, immunocompromised. Just a little pearl on inverse psoriasis versus tinea cruris. Look on the left, inverse psoriasis, very symmetric and very well demarcated. You can really draw a line around it. By contrast, tinea cruris extends inferiorly much more than it does superiorly. It's coming down the, the thigh and it's less well demarcated and less, uh, less of a similar color. You're seeing that some of that central clearing. So clinically, there's just some good clues to differentiate um, these two conditions, which are common and both occur in the same area. So another rash is here. These are reddish purplish bumps on the, the glands of the penis, on the, on the vulva quite extensively and in the perianal area. This is called lichen planus. This is another inflammatory disease of unknown cause, of which we have many in dermatology. Um, it is less common than psoriasis. Classically, it has uh, the five Ps, purple, polygonal, papular, pruritic, and planar. That's what every dermatology resident is taught to uh, uh, to, to look for. That's when it occurs on other areas of the body, though. It's less classic for the genital area. You can also have involvement in the, on the oral mucosa that can be quite painful uh, in, in that area. Can be associated with hepatitis C, so I typically will screen, screen my patients for that. The differential includes psoriasis and treatments with anti-inflammatories like corticosteroids or calcineurin inhibitors with a dermatology referral if it's extensive. Can it also occur in this annular pattern? Angulars are fancy way of saying uh, ring shape. These are some whitish firm areas of the uh, of the shaft of the penis or in the uh, in the vulvar area. And this is uh, lichen sclerosis at a trophic or LSNA or lichen sclerosis. Some people will just call it call it. It's another chronic inflammatory condition of unknown cause. In, in uh, people uh, with a penis, uncircumcised, more than uh, circumcised uh, people, it causes whitish, flat, or indented areas on the genitals, and also can occur in, in non-genital areas or extra-genital areas, as you see on the right there, causing a, like a wrinkled cigarette paper appearance. The chronic inflammation can be problematic because it can, it, it can lead to squamous cell carcinoma if it's not controlled and treated. And it's typically treated with very high potency topical steroids um, in men or people who have a, a penis. A circumcision can be uh, curative as well. You can consider a referral to dermatology uh, for, these, for these cases, and sometimes it, it makes it to uh, urology as well. Uh, OBGYN is also quite good at uh, diagnosing this. Okay, another rash is here in the various views of the, the penis with red areas, some blisters, some erosions or ulcers. It's called a fixed drug eruption. And this occurs at the same site each time an offending drug is administered. It's an idiopathic reaction um, that just occurs for reasons we're not uh, clear about. Often in single, but can, there can be multiple sites. It causes a red patch that can become target light, but then blisters and erodes. And there are drugs that can cause uh, fixed genital, uh, fixed drug eruptions, including tetracyclines like doxycycline that we use in the FTD clinic. Um, and the treatment is with um, topical steroids, which may or may not work, but really avoidance is the key. But the general area is a classic area for fixed drug eruptions. Here's one that I saw in the FTD clinic in San Francisco, somebody with a fixed drug eruption from the doxycycline that we had given him uh, in the clinic, but had fixed drug eruptions on multiple areas, including on the genital area. Um, here are some uh, photos of a, uh, of, of a rash around the, the mouth, as well as scaly stuff on the scrotum and on the, uh, 
uh, the glands of the penis, and this is secondary syphilis. On the top right is that nickels and dimes appearance of circular areas around the, the mouth, and there's uh, on the, the genital area, you can see some of that as well. These are suggestive of secondary syphilis or often the other manifestations as well on the trunk, on the palms and the soles. Um, here are some examples of somebody who's got some of the scale or some of the rounds of secondary syphilis on the, on the penis, but also the, the uh, lesions on the palms and the soles. Uh, and finally, just um, I think there might be one or two more rashes. This is called extra mammary Paget's disease. I want to spend less time on this, but just to let, make you aware of this potentially serious disease. It is a, it is a, it is a cancer um, is, uh, and can be associated with internal cancers as well. Uh, it's an itchy rash that often has been present for years. The diagnosis is by biopsy. This should be done by a dermatologist. Um, and finally, um, this is a very itchy and scaly and red and angry rash. Uh, in the peri, uh, perineal area in the, on the buttocks. And this was an allergic contact dermatitis from wet wipes. There's a preservative called methyl isothiazolidone, uh, which is present in these wet, wet wipes and uh, can cause a really bad rash. Uh, um, people will say that, well, I've, I haven't used anything new, but the way allergy works is that our, is that it's, it's that our old friends can turn against us. That's we become sensitized over time. That leads to allergy. The diagnosis is with, is with patch testing, which is done in the dermatology office. And I've shown you there on the right. You can see that very uh, red and angry and weepy spot um, on the on the right side, and that's uh, somebody reacting to this uh, ingredient that's present in wet wipes and other area, other products as well. The treatment is with topical or systemic uh, steroid, but really avoidance is critical. Let's go on to some erosions and, and ulcers. I just have a few minutes left. Um, this is um, uh, the chancres of syphilis. I'm gonna leave you with the text here because I do wanna show you uh, a couple of things. First is that multiple chancres can occur, not just a single as we read about in the textbooks. I want you to focus on um, this one on the top right. So I wanna show you a clinical sign called the Dory Flop sign of syphilis. So on the, the painting on the top right is the famous one by Winslow Homer, which uh, hangs in the National Gallery of Art in DC. A dory, in case you don't know, I didn't uh, when I first learned about this, is a small flat bottom wooden fishing boat that flips over all at once when overturned. And the dory flop sign refers to the sudden flip of the foreskin on retraction, which can differentiate shankers, which exhibit the dory flop sign, from other causes of genital ulcers, which don't produce that hardness in the skin. So I'm gonna show you a video of this, of uh, somebody retracting their uh, foreskin that has a shanker on it. So you're going to pull back and you're going to see that flop all of a sudden. There it goes. So it flops over. And other causes of ulcers like uh, genital herpes, for example, would not be expected to do that. Condyloma lata can also erode. It's a flat top weeping mass um, teeming with spirochetes, a photo of there on the, on the right. And just a reminder what the infectious lesions of syphilis really are, the chancre, the condyloma lata, and mucus patches. It's very low risk if you're in contact with other lesions of syphilis, like on the palms, if you shake somebody's hand, for example, which we're not doing anyway with COVID, but uh, that's always a concern. Can you contract syphilis from that? And that would be extremely low risk. Um, here are some, some more erosions on the, the penis and the vulva. This is genital herpes, so they're grouped vesicles on a red base. Painful, caused by HSV2, sometimes one. Um, treatment is with valacyclovir or acyclovir, and there's a lot of counseling that has to be done for these patients. So you want to uh, put this in the mix, too. This is another uh, erosions or ulcerating condition that looks very similar to, to herpes. Um, and this is herpes zoster, or shingles, as it's commonly caused. It can create a very uh, blistering and often painful rash similar to herpes. It's caused by the chickenpox virus, and it follows typically a unilateral dermatome, and that can occur if you look on the right say S2 or S3 or in the, the anal area, S1, S2, S3, S4, um, usually just on one side. And the differential diagnosis of this includes herpes. But if it's running along a line, you can consider more the, um, uh, this as well as uh, HSV in the diagnosis in the differential. Uh, this is a, uh, an ulcer on the penis. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just a reminder that LGV is around. This is a case from San Francisco. Um, that uh, was demonstrated to be LGV. Most commonly caused the causes of proctocolitis and MSM these days, but the classic sort of LGV uh, genital ulcer disease is around still. 
This is uh, painful ulcers on the scrotum. This condition is called Bechet's disease. It's inflammatory, not infectious. It's part of what's called an oculo-oral genital syndrome with recurrent painful oral and genital ulcers more prevalent in people whose ancestry comes from Asian and Mediterranean countries. Uh, this is a, uh, an ulcerating and uh, scarring and very uncomfortable condition that can affect the, uh, the inguinal folds and the mons pubic and the, the, the anal or peri perineal area as well. This is hydradenitis superativa, chronic inflammatory disease with recurrent abscess formation in skin folds occurring in women more than men, particularly in patients who are overweight. Differential would include infectious causes, and the treatment is with uh, intralesional corticosteroids, doxycycline, and adalimumab, or Humira is the brand name for that. That's a, a biologic medicine, which really has revolutionized our care of these patients and made their lives a lot better. Surgical treatment could be considered uh, as well. Uh, you wanna refer these patients probably to dermatology. Uh, this is a, a lesion on the on the penis, which is a um, which is a furuncle, uh, often caused by staph aureus. It can be painful. The patient might complain of boils elsewhere. Treatment of simple um, uh, furuncles like this is with incision and drainage, warm compresses. If they're more expensive, expensive, or if the patient is uh, has other underlying medical conditions, antibiotics could could, could be considered as well. This is a bit of a zebra, but this is one that I saw in an STD clinic. Uh, this was very painful uh, ulcers that occurred uh, for the past five days in a patient who was pretty ill and had uh, inguinal lymphadenopathy. And I think I cut out that, but I'll just tell you that this patient had recently had sex with a U.S. military service member who, before having sex with her, had been vaccinated for um, smallpox with vaccinia. Uh, which is very infectious uh, to other people and conjugal transmission has been uh, reported and the, 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 the service member had not waited for this to heal before he um, engaged with this uh, woman and, and she developed this very uncomfortable rash. I guess the good news is she's immune to smallpox, smallpox now, which is the bright side. Um, just a few pearls to finish up and then maybe I can take some questions. But just some questions when you're, to think about when you're approaching genital rashes or lesions, how long has it been there? Does it look the same as when it first appeared? If not, how has it differed? Are any other areas involved? If so, which areas? Which symptoms are present elsewhere on the skin or elsewhere on the body? What does it look like? Um, has it ever happened before? And if so, what was the cause with the word of caution there? We don't want to just repeat the last potentially incorrect diagnosis. So don't get caught up too much in, in that. And then this is, uh, this is from um, JAMA a number of years ago, but it starts sort of the other way around, right? It starts from the, um, the, the category and the name of the disease and then shows you what it, what it produces. But I think it's a nice, uh, fairly extensive differential diagnosis of uh, genital dermatoses that you could you know, put, on the, put on the wall or commit to your app or memory or something like that. Um, this is a uh, syphilis uh, poster that I, uh, uh, from a campaign that I worked on when I worked at San Francisco Department of Public Health, the Healthy Penis Campaign. And uh, with that, I think I'll try to take some, some questions. If I can find the, okay. Let's see. Thank you so much, Ken. I'm just wondering if you see in your, um, in your control box, if you see a little tab for questions, you should be able to open that. I do, I do, yes, okay. So you start at the top. Can herpes type one be genital and can herpes type two be oral? And the answer to that question is yes and yes. Um, type one is usually upstairs. Type two is usually downstairs, but they can go in other areas. In my experience, when someone is having particularly a first HSV type one eruption uh, in the genital area, that can be extremely, uh, it can be more severe than a type two eruption in the genital area. That's just what I've, what I've noticed. Okay, can a secondary syphilis body rash be on the back or only, or does it have to be on abdomen and chest also? Well, <laughs> with syphilis, the, always the answer is it can do whatever it wants. Syphilis can do anything. Um, in my experience, it would be unusual for it to be only on the back um, and not on the abdomen and, and chest. But I would not say that that rules it out. Uh, which surgical procedure for treatment of HPV removal do you use perform in the STD settings? Um, when I worked in STD clinics, I didn't have much access to 
surgical procedure. So cryotherapy or liquid nitrogen, something we would do routinely. Um, I didn't do too much of cutting them out or using electricity. With electricity, the concern is also that you're aerosolizing the virus. So I didn't use, when I was working at STD clinic, I didn't use surgical procedures commonly uh, in, in, that, in that setting. Uh, does TCA work with molluscum? Um, it might be, we can refer back to the Lancet article. I don't have much experience with, with uh, using TCA for, for molluscum. Uh, I'd worry it, it does can really burn the area. I just use that with very, a lot of, uh, a lot of caution. I guess we can use that with warts too, but it's a good question. I'm not, I'm not certain. It's not what I use in my practice. Would you recommend a patient who has been vaccinated with the old Gardasil shot be revaccinated with Gardasil 9 for increased HPV strain coverage? If you look at CDC guidelines for that, um, they don't make a recommendation for that, but there is some statement in the CDC literature that for cervical cancers and precancers, there might be some um, added benefit of the extra uh, five strains that you get there, but that's in that limited setting only. Um, there's not a blanket recommendation to do that. Uh, how can you best determine uh, or differentiate maybe psoriasis from ringworm? Uh, that's a good question. There are probably two clues. So ringworm is tinea corporis or uh, a fungal infection of the body. Um, that, will, um, that can occur anywhere on the body and psoriasis really has areas that it prefers. I mentioned the extensor areas of the uh, elbows and the knees and the, and, and the scalp like dandruff. Um, so that's one clue, where, where are you seeing it? Um, and the second clue would be what it looks like. So psoriasis is, um, should be, is typically one color through and through. It's red from the center to the edges and it has got a very clear border. Ringworm typically has central clearing. So as you're going to the center of it, the skin looks more normal and it's more red on the out, red and scaly on the outside. So those are a couple of, uh, a couple of clues. What's the typical course between initial exposure and fixed drug eruption? Usually about 24 to 48 hours in somebody who's had that reaction before. So it occurs pretty quickly. How can we uh, clinically differentiate secondary syphilis rashes on the genitals from acne? Mm. Um, Acne is not a, a typical uh, diagnosis to make in the, um, in the general area. So um, there are things that can look like secondary syphilis. For example, uh, psoriasis can cause, red, can cause red, itchy, uh, red spots or scaly spots on the, on the general area. So can um, secondary syphilis. And it's sort of, you know, what, what, what else is going on in the body? What else is the exposures? What is the epidemiological risk? of the person that might point you in the right direction there. But acne is not a diagnosis that I would encourage you to make in the, in the uh, general area. How can you differentiate healed primary syphilis chancres versus secondary syphilis genital lesions? Uh, the, the chancre will typically be a, a solo lesion. It can be multiple. You might get a different um, uh, history of it. Uh, uh, it's often, much harder or indurated than uh, compared with secondary syphilis lesions, which are really more superficial on the, on the surface of the, um, uh, of the skin and, and um, don't have that hardness when you feel it. Can psoriasis and inverse psoriasis occur uh, coexisting a single individual? Yes, they can. Yes. Um, any good derm resources you would recommend? Um, I think that uh, a lot of the um, the atlases, like a good derm atlas, like one by uh, the Fitzpatrick Derm Atlas, which has a lot of pictures, is good unless you have access to something like um, Visual DX or Up to Date is also good online. Another one that I think is excellent is DermNet MD, and that's free. Um, the issue with that is that you have to know the diagnosis in order to get there. It doesn't have, um, it's not group syndromically, as I've talked about here. But um, that's a great resource to, to educate patients on, uh, particularly on non-STD genital dermatoses. What is the specificity of HSV2 IgG? Um, that probably depends on the test you're using. I'm going to punt that to Dr. Park, uh, if she wants to take it now or later. I can take it now. Um... 
Generally speaking, the specificity is poor, especially if you're looking at uh, someone with a very low index value, which would indicate they have a pretty low level of antibody. Um, and so it, it also depends on, you know, if someone's presenting with very classic symptoms or a history of very classic symptoms or a known exposure, you know, you're more likely to believe a positive result. But there's a lot of issues with um, specificity with those assays. And so we don't recommend it to routine use for screening. Thank you. All right, is there a specific size of genital warts that you should not treat with Ophelox that needs to be sent to a dermatologist? I think the bigger you get, the less likely it's going to respond to pedophilox or the, the longer it's going to take. Um, you know, with, with, with genital warts, the, the phrase needs to be, you know, they are harmless. So you could always try pedophilox, and if it doesn't work or if they're getting a bad reaction, uh, you could then refer. So I think there's nothing wrong with trying to see what sort of reaction you're going to get. Okay, is there a rule of thumb for steroids on genitals? I worry about permanent thinning. So steroids can definitely cause um, side effects. I think that the, um, the concern for steroid side effects by patients and sometimes by clinicians actually is higher than the potential for, for problems. Um, I think usually for a lot of these conditions I've talked about, for like lichen planus, for example, or psoriasis, you can get by with a low potency topical steroid that will often do the trick, um, or a topical calcineurin inhibitor, you can use that as well. Um, but I'm always, you know, weighing risks and benefits of, of any medicine. So if somebody's really distressed by steroids and they have to be using a topical steroid on their uh, genital area, you know, I would say that probably the, the benefit outweighs any long-term, generally low risk of, of skin thinning or other problems with steroids. Um, for lichen sclerosis, that's where we really jump to the highest strength steroid from the beginning um, and often get good results from treatment of the LS without any uh, uh, problems uh, from steroids themselves. Is pedophilox not recommended for molluscum treatment? Uh, you might be able to use it. It's not something I use commonly in my practice. I usually just I use that for, for warts and use other uh, treatments for, for uh, uh, molluscum. Can one have scabies on the face? Um, the answer is yes, there's a type of scabies called crusted or Norwegian scabies. Um, that occurs in uh, people who are immunocompromised um, or uh, aren't able to take care of themselves. And that, in those cases, the, the patients typically have lots of uh, scabies mites on the body, and that can present on the scalp and the face as well. But in the garden variety scabies, where we're looking at 12 mites on the body, uh, in, in an average immunocompetent person, uh, that would not uh, occur, and I would, I would recommend thinking about a different diagnosis for uh, something on the face. At what age does pearly penile papillas usually occur? I think that's typically during adolescence that it occurs rather than at birth, during puberty. Okay, let's see. Um, how do you differentiate plasma cell balanitis versus candidal balanitis clinically? Candidal balanitis often will have that those whitish sort of clumps or cheesy material that can be scraped away, um, and it has a whitish component. Plasma cell balanitis is often more red um, and can't be scraped away. We talked about condylox and molluscum. Probably people are using that. It's just not what I typically use. Do we always have to treat molluscum? Uh, molluscum is uh, it's harmless, um, and it probably will go away on its own. Um, Patients often want it treated, um, and that's, you know, they're sort of like warts in that way that uh, that's where the impetus for treatment is, is, is uh, coming from. So I end up usually treating it because people are seeing me because they want it treated. But, it, you know, it's not going to kill anyone. Um, but I, it's, I don't, can't remember the last person who's, hasn't, who's had a mosquito who hasn't wanted it to be treated. Uh, can you use cryotherapy when warts are near the urethra? So which precautions would you take? If I'm at all concerned that I'm going to um, damage urethra, I I'm not going to use cryotherapy there. So I have to be confident that I can either put something between the wart and the urethra to protect it or otherwise, you know, otherwise protect it. Otherwise, I, I just don't want to risk that. How long can we do suppressive therapy for, for current herpes? Uh, for decades, I would say. The medicines, assuming somebody has no renal problems, 
no other issues with the medicine. It's very safe and, and well tolerated. So you can use it for a long, long time. Uh, you noted that HPV can be a cause of genital SCC, SCCIF. There's a nine valent Gardasil vaccine protecting against the strains of HPV that would cause SCC. I, I don't technically, I don't know the answer completely to that. I would say it's probably some of them, but not entirely. Um, with liquid nitrogen, uh, when you have patients come back, if lesions are still present after one treatment. This really depends on the setting. Some patients, some places will have people come back every week. Um, my clinic at KP couldn't really, uh, that would be difficult for us to do. Um, so uh, we often encourage home treatment, um, which can be quite effective and um, is less, it's just easier for the patient to not have to come in as, uh, as often. It is can. it safe to use Fidophilac from, yes. Oh, just to be mindful of the time, it's 2.05. If oh, okay. you have time to answer a few more questions, go for it. And if you need to go, just let us know. Do you want to answer questions for a few more minutes and then cut yourself off? Uh, okay. Up All right. Uh, safe to use Fidophilac, sure. Safe to use Fidophilac on the glands. Yeah, I don't see that it's a reason not to use it there. It, everything's always according to as tolerated. If it's too, to, it's too uh, irritating, tell them to stop using it. Is the syphilis rash always non-itchy? Again, syphilis can do anything, but it's typically only minimally or not itchy. Um, uh, that's what people complain of. And is, uh, I'll do one more. Can fixed drug reaction for more remotely delayed from time of taking? That's pretty unusual. It's usually within a few days. I think probably we'll, we'll stop there. Um, and I want to thank you for having me and uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for working. Do the, All right. Thanks for doing the work you do. Thank you. Uh, everyone, thank you so much, Ken, um, for this fantastic presentation. I already thought of just 10 questions at the, at the end myself. So there's always more we can learn about genital dermatology. Really appreciate your expertise. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Again, you will get an evaluation, and folks who registered will get um, the recording, as well as whatever slides um, Dr. Katz is able to share with us. So stay tuned. Look in your email boxes and... Um, if you have any questions, please email Elizabeth Olson. Um, again, her contact information should be on the announcement as well as um, on the evaluation that you're going to be getting into your email. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great afternoon.